May the peace and blessing of God be upon you, Mr. Hani al Arsa, director of the symposium, uh, their uh, expert. Uh, my name is Zaim al Hosani, researcher, a trained research and advisor on behalf of Dr. Muhammad al Ali, executive director and founder of Trends Research and Advisory. I would like to welcome you all at the third e uh, symposium of the Muslim Brotherhood on the subject called the signs of decline and strategies to survive in order to explore the evolutions that affected the Muslim Brotherhood, especially in terms of the decline of the projects after the Brotherhood suffered many uh, uh, failures in the last years. And this symposium uh, is conducted under the title of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Arab world, the signs of decline and strategies to survive. We have uh, an elite of experts uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood uh, who will tackle different important themes such as the manifestation of the decline of the Brotherhood ideology in the Arab world, the impact of transformation in Tunisia on the future of Muslim Brotherhood in the region, and the Brotherhood strategy for survival and continuity prospect for the Muslim Brotherhood in the Arab world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, organizing uh, this symposium uh, comes uh, in order to enhance uh, peace and uh, security in the world uh, by exploring and analyzing different extremist ideology in the Arab world and beyond the Arab world. Trans Research Advisory is seeking uh, to expand uh, its uh, knowledge uh, and research in this field and share ideas at different levels. Believing in the importance uh, of uh, uh, fighting with ideas and arguments, uh, Trans Research and Advisory uh, assumed the task uh, of uh, confronting uh, Islamist and extremist groups uh, uh, by deploying all necessary efforts uh, to face uh, those extremist groups and uh, to uh, uh, explore and uh, the, what they are hiding. Uh, so I would like to quote uh, from Dr. Muhammad uh, Al Ali, Executive Director and Founder of Trans Research and Advisory. We, uh, as an institution, we have become uh, a reference uh, in uh, uh, is uh, political Islam, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, your participation with us today will enhance our efforts and uh, we welcome you today and we look forward to uh, listening uh, to your contribution uh, which will be an added value. Thank you very much for your academic contribution in the works of this symposium. Now I invite uh, Dr. Hani al assa to moderate uh, this symposium. Thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Reem. Uh, thank you, uh, dear uh, uh, panelists. Uh, thank you to the audience. And thank you, Dr. Muhammad uh, Al Ali, uh, for inviting us uh, to this uh, symposium and many others organized by Trends Research and Advisory. And uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be with uh, my colleagues and friends uh, uh, from uh, the UAE. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to be with uh, th this elite of experts in the field. And I hope uh, that uh, I can add uh, a value to the works uh, that you are conducting. And we will start uh, directly with uh, Dr. Ali Mustafa. And he will give uh, his speech, uh, and uh, according to the schedule, uh, every speaker is allowed 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, hopefully we will uh, have the, the chance uh, to uh, ask you also some questions related uh, to the topic at the end. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hani. Uh, did you say I have 10 minutes, or is it uh, 15 minutes? Uh, you have the time. Take your time, Doctor. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. I would like to thank uh, Trends uh, uh, for inviting me to this symposium. 
uh, in my uh, speech, uh, actually, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the, uh, the party of uh, uh, justice uh, and development as an Islamist party, uh, which is considered uh, as a party linked to the ideology of Muslim brotherhood. I will start with uh, two remarks uh, before uh, delving deep uh, into the subject. The first remark uh, concerns uh, the Moroccan context, through which I would like to try to explain uh, the Islamic uh, context of the uh, Justice and Development Party. The history of, uh, of this uh, party, uh, maybe its peculiarity, uh, uh, something that we cannot ignore when we analyze uh, the evolution of uh, political Islam in this country and the relationship between the political and the religious uh, in Morocco is based uh, on tactical choices and the pragmatic issue. And uh, most of the time, uh, they are far away from ideological uh, dimension. In this context, uh, the impact of the ideology of Muslim brotherhood on parties and political movement in Morocco is subject uh, to continuous uh, political discussion, which is uh, split between two camps. And uh, I will explain that uh, further after uh, the second remark. The second remark about the ideology of the Muslim brotherhood, maybe it's necessary to uh, explain what we mean uh, by the ideology or the thoughts of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, among the messages we find uh, in Hassan al-Banna writing is that uh, he gave uh, the name of uh, uh, comprehensiveness uh, of Islam, uh, like uh, the nationalism uh, is uh, for uh, everyone all over the world uh, and it's not limited. So this is the comprehensive perception uh, that uh, Hassan al-Banna came up with. And uh, starting uh, from this context and the definition of Hassan al-Banna of uh, the doctrine of uh, the brotherhood, uh, we have two camps in Morocco regarding the ideology, the Islamic ideology in Morocco. The first camp uh, considered that the Islamist ideology stems from inside and is completely disconnected from the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, while the second camp believes that there is no exception uh, in the Moroccan uh, context uh, and that the political uh, movement in Morocco were always under the Islamic uh, uh, influence that's imported uh, starting from the 60s for some and 70s for others. Within uh, this framework, uh, the Moroccan authorities allow political Islam, which is emerging locally, to take its place uh, within political sphere uh, with uh, an ideological ideology that's uh, new to it. And this ambiguity continues till now within the political arena in Morocco. And the strategies of the Moroccan authorities uh, towards uh, the political uh, movement and parties uh, which have uh, uh, ideo uh, Islamic ideology and was based on pragmatism and uh, a lack of trust, uh, regardless of some attempts uh, from them uh, to dominate uh, some uh, political uh, movement uh, and curb uh, their influence. Uh, the Moroccan authorities believe that uh, these movements can help uh, indirectly in enhancing the foundations of uh, the official uh, legitimate religious authority in Morocco. In other, on the other hand, uh, the concerned uh, political movement believe that participating in the political game or at least uh, taking part uh, in the social uh, movement would allow them uh, to gain uh, recognition at the long term. These contradictions uh, lead uh, to the penetration of Islam into politics and uh, by focusing on uh, the the party of justice and development in Morocco is because we consider it as the place where this contradiction takes place and as a means to avoid the further complication of this subject we need to distinguish between Islamist parties which are believed to be moderate such as uh, uh, the Party of Justice and Development in Turkey or Al-Nahda in Tunisia or the part 
or the uh, Party of Development Justice in Morocco, that these parties are trying uh, to participate uh, in democratic processes uh, to gain legitimacy from the constituents. Uh, but uh, we have some Salafist uh, movement, uh, some of them are very extremist and uh, calling uh, for extremist actions. And what we have noticed in the last decades is that most Islamist movements uh, that are described as moderate are accepting the process of elections and they get involved in the election and participate in the parliamentary and municipality and presidential election and they take part in the, in the government directly through the constitution. In Morocco, such Islamist movements which are moderate are legitimate and officially licensed to operate in the political arena. The relationship between the religious and the political in Morocco is an organized relationship in the long term and that dates back to the colonial dates, days from 1912 till 1956 and even after the independence and this uh, uh, political experience uh, show, uh, showed some uh, tension uh, between uh, the parties uh, of uh, the national movement, especially uh, Al Istiqlal party, which is a party of with the Salafist ideology, and he is it is very proud of that ideology, and uh, the King institution. The relationship led to the emirate of the commander of the believers in Morocco. So the central authority now in Morocco is at the hands of the king, considering him as the commander of the believers. He is the religious leader of the Moroccan people. At the same time, he is the head of state. From this idea, no other political party can compete with the king in the religious field. And as a legitimate political party, the Party of Justice and Development cannot claim that it is offering Moroccan's religious discourse that goes against the discourse of the commander of the believers, which is the king. And at the heart of this relationship between the king and his uh, subject, we have what is called the idea of uh, Bayad, allegiance. And uh, it's a contact between uh, the rulers uh, and uh, the subject. And uh, the, uh, the religious parties, uh, they participate in enhancing that relationship. And if we ask uh, the members of uh, uh, the PGD uh, party about the uh, uh, ideological uh, belonging, they would say that uh, there is no relationship between the, the Party of Justice and Development and the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the, the former uh, 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 Prime Minister of Morocco, al uh, said that uh, the reference of uh, the Party of Justice and Development uh, is inspired uh, from the thoughts of Al-Lal al-Fasi, one of the founders uh, of the Party of Al-Istiqlal. Uh, as for the political reforms, if one of the objectives of the Muslim Brotherhood is to establish Islamic Islamic Republic in all Arab countries, the ambitions of the Party of Justice and Development are more humble and are different. And as Saad al-Din al said, the Party of Justice and Development is uh, completely different uh, from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in terms of the strategy because uh, the party was uh, never a part uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, although they may share uh, the same Islamist uh, value. So uh, we are really uh, at odds. Uh, we have uh, Al Adl Wal Ihsan, uh, with, uh, which is uh, an association uh, linked uh, in ideology to the, the Party of Justice and Development. Uh, and from the positions and declaration, uh, we can uh, gauge uh, 
the level of moderation of uh, just Justice and Development Party, and we can summarize the program of uh, Al Adl Wal Ihsan movement in a few things. Uh, changing the political system in Morocco. Uh, second, uh, uh, to uh, remove the title of the commander of the believers in Morocco to, the, to bring back Islam uh, to the Moroccan society. Uh, these uh, things, they are not uh, among the program of uh, the Party of Justice and Development, although uh, they have uh, a close uh, relationship in terms of their thoughts. On the from his side, uh, Mr. Idris al Kanboi, who is expert uh, in uh, uh, Islamic uh, movement in Morocco, he said that the relationship between uh, uh, Justice and Development Party and Muslim Brotherhood uh, is a fact. Uh, and uh, the proof uh, is that we have uh, some members of Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist movement uh, in conferences organized. Uh, uh, in Morocco by Justice and Development Party. And the same uh, goes uh, to conferences organized uh, by Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, outside of Morocco. And the representatives of uh, Justice and Development uh, Party uh, say that uh, the philosophy behind the presence uh, is uh, uh, to, st to stay abreast uh, and to evaluate the situation in general uh, and to exchange experience and interest uh, and to coordinate uh, positions, but uh, still there is ambiguity about this relationship they have with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the development, uh, uh, the Justice and Development Party uh, came to power uh, uh, 10 years ago uh, in the aftermath uh, of the evolution of 2011, and its election uh, was something desired by the uh, the, the monarchy in Morocco and also given the changing situation uh, in the region and Morocco managed uh, with the election now of uh, uh, Justice and Development Party uh, uh, falling into the same chaos uh, that affected other countries uh, uh, and uh, which uh, went through uh, difficult times that some of them still could not uh, get out of. The 10 years of uh, Justice and Development Party uh, allowed uh, to uh, see different political concessions that reflect uh, the role uh, of the deep state in Morocco and the real uh, governance uh, of uh, the regime uh, after 10 years. And it would be now wrong uh, to assume that uh, Justice and Development Party in Morocco has left uh, any uh, Islamic uh, reference that is deeper in society. Uh, so moving from hidden uh, to legitimate uh, actions uh, according to Mohammed uh, Tozi, uh, who, was, uh, who is one of the experts uh, in the uh, political Islam. Uh, uh, Justice and Development Party has become a party of uh, public administration. Uh, it's a conservative uh, nationalist uh, with a uh, uh, slight uh, Islamist uh, difference uh, flavor. But uh, Justice and Party Development uh, has adapted to the political situation even before when the election of 2011 and the first uh, uh, big, the first beginning started to emerge in the early 90s, where the political issue and the ideological pragmatism uh, dominated uh, over the uh, Islamist one. So the adaptation and the concessions are signals uh, of survival because disappearing does not uh, mean the end, but it's some sort of adaptation and some measures for survival. There are many examples uh, about uh, this change. Uh, Justice uh, and Development Party, which always uh, defends uh, Arabic language, uh, uh, mentioned in September 2013 that uh, French language will be used to teach scientific subjects uh, in physics, uh, science, and mathematics uh, at high schools. 
uh, this idea uh, was faced with too much criticism by the International Union of uh, uh, Muslim Ulema. Uh, they said that uh, this would be like a, a backlash uh, for uh, the Arabic uh, civilizations. Uh, and uh, they uh, the, the last thing we have seen is that uh, the relationship uh, that uh, was with Israel and different concessions made by Justice and Development Party were based uh, on the evaluation uh, uh, of the, the gains and the losses. Uh, this is what explains why Abdel El Abin Kian did not support uh, the movement of 20 February in 2011, although that movement uh, uh, helped the uh, Justice and Development Party uh, to power. And uh, maybe this is why Saad al-Din al-Uthmani did not want to interfere uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the issue of the detainees of uh, Arif area in 2017. Uh, and uh, such uh, uh, inter intervention, the public opinion could not explain. Uh, all this is designed to show that to the uh, to the to the king that is how the new uh, justice and development party look like and uh, in the general in the official meeting they claim that they're going uh, to change uh, themselves but at the end uh, it's uh, the monarchy that changed uh, this party during the, the uh, during the years of the government of Saad Din al Uthmani, the pragmatism of the Justice and Development Party looked like more harmonized with the, with the government by legitimizing the weed in Morocco and also about discussions regarding abortion. So they have like double standards that they keep adopting, so they would not uh, have a clear camp that they would be joining. So behind these contradictions in the discourse, uh, we can see the contradicted relationship between uh, the party and uh, the monarchy, uh, uh, which fluctuates between uh, acceptance and uh, ejection. And there is uh, uh, an Islamic uh, discourse that transcends uh, the borders uh, and it's obsessed uh, with an Islamic state uh, that will be based uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood ideology. Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, your time is up uh, and the uh, Moroccan case is uh, very important uh, and I would like to ask uh, some questions uh, maybe at the end of this symposium, if we have time. Uh, we thank you for your uh, presentation. We'll move now to Dr. Uh, Amani, uh, who will uh, talk to us uh, about uh, the manifestation of the decline of the Ba'adahud ideology in the Arab world. And uh, before giving you the floor, uh, I would like to ask you, Dr. Amani, if you can answer in your speech, uh, uh, can we say that uh, this ideology is declining uh, or can the ideology, uh, this is a question, the, the ideology, can, can we say that an idea or an ideology would decline, uh, especially for the case of the Muslim brotherhood in the Arab world uh, in the last years? So I will give you the floor. Uh, you have uh, 15 minutes, uh, Dr. Amani. Uh, thank you, and I would like to greet you from Canada. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be invited uh, within the context uh, of uh, Trent's uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, I am very pleased uh, with the choice uh, of the subject, and I would like to organize uh, of this symposium uh, for their organization. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for accepting my papers uh, because, uh, as you know, I live in Canada and the current uh, here they defend the Muslim Brotherhood in Canada because of different uh, reasons that Dr. Wai Saleh would explain that further. 
but I would say that the discourse of Muslim brotherhood uh, is a uh, uh, discourse of victimhood uh, uh, in which they excel uh, and the media policy that the Muslim brotherhood is using to promote uh, their idea and to shed light uh, on what they uh, consider as uh, the policies and that uh, viewed policy, but it was just some tactics uh, to absorb the strike uh, that they were getting, uh, as mentioned by the researcher Ibrahim Ma'ali. And uh, this is just like uh, the jihadists uh, and the Salafists uh, that uh, uh, used the uh, revision of their policies after the killing of Sadat. Uh, but we remember uh, one meeting of Asim Abdel Shahir in 2013 when he said that it was for the reasons that ended uh, with the arrival uh, of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, although uh, this uh, uh, Brotherhood, uh, they, ha they started using the methodology of Sayyid Qutb as said, uh, was said by Muhammad Mursi. So to answer your question, uh, the title of uh, my presentation is Ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood. Is it a main component of the decline, the basis of political discourse of Muslim Brotherhood in power and the concept of citizenship uh, at stake? Uh, uh, and I have a PowerPoint to share with you. So, a general overview uh, of the literature uh, that analyzed the Islamist movement showed that most of the Western studies uh, focus on, on the Islamist uh, discourse uh, based uh, on the literature of Salafists, and we have many examples. Abu Bakr Naji, one of the important uh, uh, COE experts of uh, ISIS, uh, and the one who came up with the idea of uh, managing uh, uh, violence, uh, decided that the Muslim Brotherhood is the mother of the t contemporary Islamism, or through uh, the Muslim Brotherhood as it was tackled by the minority of Muslims. And most of the analysis that uh, tackled uh, Brotherhood violence with the non-Islamists uh, adopt uh, a defensive uh, position. Uh, this is why, without ignoring the strategic factors and the social factors that play the role uh, in, the, uh, the, in the emergence of the Muslim Brotherhood, we would like to shed some light on the epistemology of uh, violence in the Muslim Brotherhood discourse uh, for the values of citizenship and how this discourse uh, led to the decline of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, this research contributes uh, in knowledge not only by tackling uh, the gap uh, of uh, the way that the Muslim Brotherhood look at the others who are non-Islamists, but also by linking uh, the institutional concept of the discourse. Uh, this paper is part uh, of uh, a bigger research which tackles a uh, uh, comparison of the political and social uh, discourse uh, between uh, uh, Islamist movement which reached power uh, to shed light uh, on uh, approachments and difference uh, in this field. Uh, this paper aims to explore uh, how uh, the concept of uh, uh, brotherhood uh, uh, policy uh, wants to uh, define the concept of citizenship uh, based uh, on uh, religious uh, belonging to non of non-Muslim, based also on uh, how they abide or deviate from the Islamist uh, methodology as they promote, which explain uh, the citizenship violence. So I'm going to focus on the ideology. Quest questions of the research. Who is the other in the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood? To what extent does the Islamist discourse of Muslim Brotherhood violate the rights and freedoms of the citizens? What are the epistemological foundation of these sources? And what are the means of implementing these principles? 
hypothesis of the research uh, are based uh, on the fact that the conflict uh, of the people about uh, the ruling of the Muslim Brotherhood was based, uh, as said by Mr. Sayyid Qutb, uh, called the Pats uh, in the way. It's not uh, a conflict uh, between two civilizations, not a clash between two civilizations. It's a perception uh, of a society uh, ruled uh, by uh, Islamic uh, doctrine. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a limited perception inside the group or outside of it. Uh, as for the individualism uh, that is the Muslim Brotherhood, a racist uh, organization that uh, adopts uh, regular discrimination, uh, our, uh, our problematics of this research uh, is to explain the basis and uh, concept uh, of the citizenship uh, at the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and they were only uh, ex dis disclosed uh, to their experience uh, at the government. And uh, we are going uh, to, ha to use uh, three uh, themes, uh, uh, the perception of the, the Muslim Brotherhood of the others, uh, the concept of identity and definition of uh, the state of law. And we're going uh, to define uh, Muslim Brotherhood based on the foundation of the state, uh, which is one of the main elements uh, for the country that will allow us uh, to look uh, at the main elements of the state and the fascist uh, regime that uh, want to rebuild the state based on a different affiliation. A foundation of this, uh, the research. We analyze the discourse and the content through first the website of the Muslim Brotherhood, Ikhwan Online, and also by studying uh, uh, cases uh, and uh, data and declarations. Uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and we have seen that uh, this data uh, they came out uh, from Islamist authorities uh, that uh, we established uh, in. 25th January. We, we have also Ikhwan online, uh, uh, which we use to, to analyze uh, data. And uh, as we said, uh, it, uh, it was uh, established after 25th January. We have uh, the legitimate authority for rights and the reforms. It was established in 2011. It had uh, 19 members, including Khayat al Shatta and the Council of Shura of Ulama, which was established in February 2011. We're going to look at the uh, articles uh, of uh, the Islamic, Islamist constitution. And uh, we are going to use uh, a comparative approach uh, of uh, discourse uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood and the declaration and how they are linked uh, to the uh, theory expert uh, of the Brotherhood, uh, such as al -Banna. First, perception of the Muslim Brotherhood of the others. Uh, from uh, in-group versus out-group, uh, we have seen that uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, the divide uh, people in uh, two ways, as was said by uh, Tajfel and Turner, uh, in-group versus out-group. Uh, based uh, on this uh, classification, uh, they have the state of law we have uh, in the group, we have the Islamist uh, and the Jihadist. Uh, as uh, we have learned from the uh, declarations, uh, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, al Din Al-Qassam, uh, factions uh, and the countries uh, which uh, implement uh, Sharia. And these uh, uh, categories are at the top of the group. And from the analysis, we found out uh, that the Salafists are criticized uh, by the Muslim Brotherhood, although they are affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they criticize and uh, they, uh, they encourage uh, how Salafists uh, uh, exist in the, the Sufis. And this is the pragmatic uh, uh, policy, uh, unlike the Salafists uh, who eject uh, Sufism uh, and Shia. Uh, outside uh, the group, uh, the non-Islamists, all of them without exception, uh, we have uh, this uh, category. Uh, under it, we have two subcategories. Uh, we have the uh, Muslims and non-Islamists, uh, which they consider uh, as uh, 
uh, not uh, good enough. Uh, and we have uh, also a Shia, uh, although they support Hezbollah, and we have uh, Sufist uh, and uh, liberal uh, and secular Muslims, uh, which they consider as enemies uh, of the interior and the government, uh, which do not uh, apply uh, Sharia. They consider them as found. And those who support them, such as uh, police and security services, uh, they call them Tarut. Uh, and all of these are uh, expressions uh, that uh, we can find at Ikhwan online. And uh, Al-Azhar uh, ulama, they call them ulama of uh, the authority. Uh, and uh, they also uh, use the, uh, the Muslims uh, who celebrate the no-Muslim uh, occasions. So uh, this is the other uh, form inside. Uh, we have the other form outside, the non-Muslim, uh, such as the Copts, uh, because uh, uh, they consider them uh, as the fabric of society and the Jewish without distinguishing between uh, uh, those uh, who adopt uh, the Jewish uh, religion. And they consider that those Jewish, they are against Islam uh, and uh, they are uh, fighting uh, Gaza and and the West uh, is, uh, has a conspiracy uh, against Islam. And they uh, summarized uh, the concept of uh, Qutb uh, and his idea about Mus uh, non Islamists uh, who are uh, Muslims who do not adopt uh, Islamism. So he summarized the relationship even uh, within the same country and the term the conflict. And within the nation, uh, he said, we find uh, uh, the animosity and uh, for the liberal and the secular, they are called them as uh, the conspiracy member who hate Islam. And from this classification, uh, we came up with the final goal of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is uh, uh, professorship of the world. And this slogan uh, was shaped by uh, Hassan al-Banna. And uh, he did not hesitate to choose uh, this word uh, for professorship. And Mohammed Badia also carried uh, the, the flag of uh, professorship uh, in 2013, uh, one year after they took uh, power. Uh, the guide of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, used the same slogan uh, as, uh, as master of the world. Uh, he said, this is not a disdain of the other, but this is a responsibility. So after uh, this occupation, uh, which he claims that he is trying to fight and, uh, and to spread the values uh, of uh, his organization. Uh, we have uh, the concept of identity of the Muslim Brotherhood. The contemporary Muslim Brotherhood uh, with the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood is a culture of identity. You have uh, one minute. It's a, a culture of identity. Uh, how can we imagine the country uh, and the, the rule of the Muslim Brotherhood? They say it's a civil state, but the civil state has a definition uh, linked to the Brotherhood. It's not uh, military, it's not theocrats. And uh, translated the policy in so many examples uh, that they don't have time for. And uh, this definition also uh, for the individuals and to what extent uh, they stick uh, to Islamism. And this was a reflect uh, in the fatwa of the uh, Council uh, of uh, Reform. Uh, I have one minute. I will finish. And uh, this said we should not choose uh, uh, a ruler who would not apply uh, Sharia, I uh, was supposed also uh, to tackle the constitution, which has a uh, Trojan horse uh, for Islamist value, uh, but uh, it's included in my research.
uh, in the aftermath of the evolution of 2011, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in power faced uh, some uh, difficulties uh, making uh, equilibrium uh, between uh, 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 the Islamism uh, and democracy, and they failed uh, at both sides. Uh, where is the, the individu individualism uh, and uh, as part of the political project uh, and also the practices that they were conducting, and this uh, would lead uh, to a discriminatory uh, institution that is completely ejected, uh, as explained by Michel Labelle, uh, who uh, defined the uh, institutional uh, discrimination uh, as uh, ideology uh, and uh, policy for both. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, it becomes uh, an action uh, and also a political stand. Uh, uh, this is why the ideology is one of the reasons of decline of the brotherhood. Thank you. Uh, doctor, we enjoyed your speech. Uh, We hope that uh, we will get some answers uh, in future discussions now. Qasem uh, will uh, talk to us and he will talk about uh, Islamism and uh, the situation uh, in uh, Tunisia and the impact of that uh, on the Arab region. And I hope that uh, the Tunisian uh, case is uh, a case that uh, can let us extract some lessons. So I would like to remind you that you have 15 minutes and I hope that the trained colleagues switch on the microphone for me beforehand so that I can introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Mr. Hani. And uh, I thank uh, Trent's Research and Advisory for this uh, symposium. Uh, I would like uh, to share with you that uh, I uh, really enjoyed uh, the two presentations uh, of uh, the two previous uh, speakers. My presentation is about uh, the impact of transformation in Tunisia on the future of the Muslim Brotherhood in the region. I will focus uh, on the latest uh, development that took place uh, in uh, last July, uh, 25th of July. That was uh, a turning point uh, in Tunisia because uh, it uh, was a sign for uh, the collapse of uh, the, uh, the so-called Arab Spring, which was marked by uh, the advent of uh, Islamists. And uh, I would like uh, to focus uh, on the incident of July 25th, especially on the Al-Nahda movement in Tunisia. And I would like also to talk about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in the world. And uh, I will uh, try to describe what's happening uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood. And I will talk about the decline uh, and the... Uh, stickiness uh, to survival. I will, as we'll share with you, the lessons that uh, we should extract from uh, this development. Uh, if we look uh, at the Al-Nahda movement in Tunisia, we have to mention that uh, what uh, happened in uh, 2011 was a historical moment, but uh, unfortunately, the Muslim Brotherhood kidnapped that historic moment and uh, turned it uh, into an opportunity to empower themselves. And of course, uh, we have to say that uh, they, consider, they considered that historic moment uh, the end of history and they started to Islamize the society. And we saw that clearly in Tunisia. However, what uh, happened in uh, the summer of 2013 was like an earthquake and this uh, pushed Anahda to uh, recalculate its considerations and of course uh, we saw several assassinations, the spread of terrorism, the economic uh, 
crisis, etc. At that time, there was a national dialogue, and at that time, also the movement of An Nahda took a step back and adopted a policy of compromises in order to contain that crisis and to come back after the elections of 2014. And after those elections, she controlled the different axes of the state of Tunisia. So what was the result of the government of the Anada movement? It was very negative, politically speaking. There are institutions that are bottlenecked, and we saw that with the president Qais Saied and the government of Hisham al-Mashishi. Economically speaking, every indicator shows that uh, there is uh, a collapse especially with the COVID-19 the financial indicators uh, are uh, very bad and they are worse uh, than what we saw in the last decades the general loan uh, uh, is uh, exceeding the equivalent of 100% uh, of the GDP so in general there is a failure at all levels. On the other hand, there is an accumulation of the benefits from ruling, and this led to protest in the streets against another movement. And in, in reality, the protests have never ceased in the last 10 years. But uh, there was a climax of this protest on July 25th of this year. And uh, in my opinion, the decisions of the president were very important because for the first time we saw that the Anada movement outside the ruling system in Tunisia, and I mean outside the parliament and outside the government. What are the significances of uh, this uh, change and this uh, development? Uh, first, with regards to Anahda movement, it found itself isolated socially. Because what uh, the President Qais Saied did was preceded by an intifada against uh, Anahda movement, and we remind the audiences that the protesters uh, walked to Anahda HQ, and this uh, has uh, one interpretation, which is that they were revolting against Anahda movement. And regardless of the source of uh, the slogans of Anahda, Islam uh, is the solution, is the only solution, etc., or the tactical ideology and the speech that they use and uh, saying that they are revising their approaches, etc. Such a discourse uh, is no longer convincing. We found that uh, in the morning of July, 25th, the Anahda movement could not even mobilize their fans and supporters because Rashid al Ghanoushi called upon them to go to the streets. So, this means that there is a social isolation of the Anahda movement, and if we use the Gramsci notion. Anahda movement could not uh, impose uh, its uh, ideology on the society. Socially speaking, Anahda movement found itself isolated, and uh, after it uh, exited power, all the political parties uh, prevented uh, establishing any relations with Anahda and also the labor union of Tunisia 
did the same, prevented to have contact with the Anada movement. So it is politically isolated and socially isolated. After the 25th of July, we found that more than 130 resignations of the Anada movement uh, were submitted and this included some leaders of the front lines and this divide was not uh, the direct result of july the 25th but it preceded that uh, incident and that development and of course we know that the um, national conference uh, is uh, still uh, postponed uh, and now it is more than one year that is uh, postponed. Tunisia was uh, the last uh, stronghold of the Muslim Brotherhood and we heard Mr. Ali Mustafa who said that uh, among uh, the characteristics of uh, the uh, Moroccan experience is that it was always uh, under the umbrella of uh, the royal uh, rule. In Tunisia, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, through Anahda took power, which means that uh, they were representing one stronghold that is important for the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the world. And they tried uh, to uh, get all the political support in order to keep their control of the state and they wanted uh, Tunisia to remain under the control of Anahda in order to be the axis of uh, the comeback of the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the world. So we can say that they lost uh, through the fall of Anahda movement the last uh, a very important stronghold. So another movement today is uh, facing several uh, challenges. There is a divide inside that movement. There is the challenge of losing uh, their presence uh, in the political arena and also there are uh, some uh, problems uh, that are chasing Anahda, like uh, some uh, financial corruptions and also uh, the fact that uh, they are representing Muslim Brotherhood uh, ideology that is uh, transnational. The other elements that I would like to share with you is uh, how to interpret this development. Uh, so uh, this uh, changes uh, or they representing uh, a decline of the Muslim Brotherhood or just a fall and they will uh, rise again uh, and survive. Let me talk uh, about uh, the diagnosis of uh, what's happening in the present and compare this with the past. And let me talk about two major stations. The first station is that uh, the experiences of the past, the Muslim Brotherhood group acquired throughout its long history an experience in dealing with crises. And this experience made it uh, able to adapt uh, to the situations where there are constraints and difficulties. So its history is a series of uh, falls and rises, uh, pressures, uh, constraints, challenges, etc. So it is something very important for the Muslim Brotherhood. Also, the Muslim Brotherhood group has an ideological background and this background is based on this concept and notions of the test of the Muslim conservative and how they survive in facing all the challenges. On the other hand, 
while they have this expertise in dealing with crises and especially after 2011, after the so-called Arab Spring, the societies in Tunisia and in Egypt and in particular in Tunisia because there was no existence of the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunisia so the Arab societies accumulated an experience now in dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood and they tested them not only as opposition parties and movements that are always playing this card of victimhood but they tested them in the government and the Arab communities and Arab societies had great expectations however they were disappointed so the illusion of the Muslim Brotherhood is now revealed to all the citizens in the Arab countries and uh, everyone in the Arab world discovered this uh, void and this illusion in the slogans that were raised by the Muslim Brotherhood. So we are facing here this expertise of the Muslim Brotherhood in dealing with the crises and the challenges and the experience that was acquired by the Arab societies in dealing with the, the Muslim Brotherhood in the government. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our time expires. You have to conclude, uh, please. I think that I still have three minutes, right? So I'm saying that the result is how we would judge this uh, balance uh, between the experience of the Muslim Brotherhood in dealing with challenges and crises and the experience now of the Arab societies which uh, tried uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and they were disappointed. And I think that we have some lessons uh, learned to share. The Arab societies uh, have to extract the lessons from uh, this uh, experience uh, and also the Arab society's memory should remain revived in order to always remember how they were in the government. And I would like to say that the elites and the think tanks in the Arab world should continue working in order to enlighten the Arab citizens. And we have to work more in we have to work more on renovating the curricula of the education and we have to focus on bringing up generations that are well aware of the source and the origin of the muslim brotherhood and the tools and elements they use and also we have to produce content not to counter the propaganda of the Muslim Brotherhood, but to spread the renovated notions that are constructive. And also we have to work on protecting those who are vulnerable to the Muslim Brotherhood with their ideologies, speeches and discourses. Finally, I would like to say that we have to continue the discussions, not nationally, only but also regionally in order uh, to uh, disarm all uh, this uh, uh, Islamist groups that uh, have foreign finances with uh, their relations with different uh, influencers uh, in the world and uh, to uh, neutralize their uh, finances from different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Uh,
Of course, uh, I would love to hear more about the Tunisian uh, experience because it is an experience that uh, that is worth uh, discussion. And we know that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, failed after the failure of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And of course, uh, we know that uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates uh, uh, have hailed uh, the efforts uh, to counter uh, the Muslim Brotherhood experience uh, in uh, Tunisia and uh, in Morocco. I uh, think that in this uh, symposium, I would love to hear from uh, his Excellency Dirar Balhul Al Falasi, because he has published several articles about the Muslim Brotherhood and he talked about the threat that is represented by this movement. And this symposium is taking place after Mustafa Tolba, the Egyptian businessman who lives in uh, Turkey and of course he is belonging to the front of Mahmoud Hussein now he is uh, controlling the council of Shura in uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, this is uh, in co competition of uh, the front of London uh, of Mr. Ibrahim. So we are about to see some clear aspects of divide. We are seeing like three Muslim Brotherhood movements, three axes. So maybe this can be starting point that Mr. Dirar Balhul Al Falasi can uh, initiate uh, and of course uh, we are uh, wishing to hear more about uh, his perspectives about uh, the presence of Muslim Brotherhood in other Arab countries and what are the strategies that we can embrace uh, in the future. So you have the floor uh, Mr. Al Falasi and you have uh, 15 minutes so uh, I would love if you abide by uh, this uh, 15 minutes. You have the floor. Good evening uh, to you. And I'm very happy to be part of this elite uh, of uh, speakers. Uh, and I join my uh, voice uh, to most of my colleagues, the previous speakers, but uh, allow me to talk uh, practically and not academically. What uh, the United Arab Emirates did uh, is uh, important. Uh, I wrote and uh, said that uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, was uh, a kind of uh, water breaker to the Arab Spring. Uh, and we saw the revolutions, the coup d'etats, and uh, of course uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were aware, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood members were aware of uh, the strict position against them. Uh, and uh, we can easily know that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood have a grudge against uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed and the state of the United Arab Emirates because uh, the United Arab Emirates took measures that are clear. I believe in one thing, the Muslim Brotherhood are the source of uh, all the disasters and every calamity that uh, happened in the Arab world has something to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. If we look at the Syrians uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda and the different uh, extremist groups, uh, originally they are from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, let's say that uh, between 60 to 80 years, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were uh, 
planning to use this victimhood card in order to jump to the power. They have always promoted the narrative of victimhood and some countries in the West were convinced and believed that they are really victims and of course 80 years of planning and when they got the chance they seized it and let me say that if the Muslim Brotherhood could not jump to power at 2011 because the situation was disastrous and if they allowed the chance to another entity, another party, to take the punch, they could have found it easily. But they are thirsty to the power. So, if you remember, in the beginning, they said, we are not participating in the elections. But uh, there was a divide uh, internally that uh, took place uh, and they found that uh, they got their chance. And I said in one conference that uh, this happening was a mercy because people did not know really the real nature of the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, they voted for them uh, as a way to punish uh, the predecessors. So it was uh, a punishing vote. And by the way, I would like to mention one thing. I was bitten uh, on uh, two years uh, I, I bet that in one year, in two years, they will collapse, but they didn't last for two years. In one year, they collapsed. And I remember that I was with my colleague Mohammed Al Mullah, and I told him that they are preparing the second line and the third line. And uh, those uh, members of the second line and the third line will be liberal. And Dr. Ali said that uh, maybe the situation in Morocco is unique because there is uh, the king who is the commander of the believers. Uh, and uh, the king led them uh, to integrate in that uh, melting pot. But now there are... Uh, two clashes uh, and I think that uh, there is the new Muslim Brotherhood who are the youth, the third and the fourth line lines who will uh, dissect from the old school Muslim Brotherhood and we know that uh, now they started accepting the homosexuals and they started to accept hashish and they were always opposing this uh, trends however the changes that are taking place now and the pressure that is uh, exercised against them push them to that level and i do believe that uh, things started to be revealed more clear, clearly, they are living a difficult situation. I think that we should dry and drain the sources of the terrorism. And we know that the Muslim Brotherhood were dependent on the associations and the charity associations and I was the president of the social committee and was in charge of the law that regulates the donations in the UAE and that law 
repealed uh, that uh, gap uh, of uh, doing the good for the people. So we know that uh, the donations uh, were 30,000, 60,000, and they were benefited from those uh, donations. This is over in UAE. It's why I'm saying that if we drain this uh, source of terrorism, we will be successful and we'll make it. And we have to understand that uh, they used the, the Alfidia notion and we know that uh, ISIS uh, used that model. Why? Because uh, they ran out of money and uh, I call upon my colleagues, the writers and the thinkers, to scrutinize the origins and the resources of the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean the financial origins, because the financial transactions and the financial transfers uh, should be revised in order to fill any gap that is exi existing and the loopholes. So if we can limit uh, these uh, resources, I promise you, Dr. Ali, because Dr. Ali was accepting them gradually, and I think that uh, an Nahda and the Muslim Brotherhood in general will disappear because they use the emotions and they use the card of victimhood. They always say that they are poor people and they are victims. And when they started in the UAE, there were accusations and I was criticized by attacking them and I uh, have been told that they are poor people and they are victims. But uh, gradually, they were uh, revealed to everyone in the UAE and their truth was revealed. And uh, when you tell somebody you are a Muslim Brotherhood member, it is like an insult. So we reached uh, a level to not tolerate uh, describing somebody a Muslim Brotherhood member and it is considered now an offense and I think that in in two countries in the Gulf there are the remnants of the Muslim Brotherhood and now Turkey asked the Muslim Brotherhood to leave so the only safe haven for the Muslim Brotherhood will remain London and I think that eventually even London will expel them and they will find no place to live and to nurture and I think that Erdogan for instance in a very financial in a very bad situation financially and the lira currency is collapsing and if it reaches 20 if the dollar reaches 20 lira so the turks will migrate from turkey so i think that their end is looming and we have to be patient and i would like to say that if we succeed in drying the sources of financing the muslim brotherhood in this case, uh, they will have uh, no uh, presence and no existence. And I hope that we see a day to see that realized, not because we hold a grudge against them, but because they are dangerous. And Dr. Amani said uh, discrimination, and they say that they are the Muslim Brotherhood. And we say we are also Muslims, so but we are not part of them, because when you say Muslim Brotherhood, 
do you represent all the Muslims? No. So this is a discrimination against the Muslims. And I join my voice to Dr. Amani. I say that they represent the top of discrimination. And I experienced that. And they will not hesitate in using the different uh, tactics like the assassination. Because the character assassination is something they excel in. It's why they became very bad even in uh, assassinating the characters uh, they will not succeed because how many characters you will assassinate to reach your objective? If you go through their history, you will find out that, uh, as Mr. Farid said, they tried to assassinate Abir Musi, the member of the parliament, and uh, she is a member of the parliament like me, and uh, I... Uh, hail her courage and the bravery because she is a woman that stood against al ghanoushi and one day she was attacked physically and i think that when the attacked physically abir musi that was the last straw that caused their collapse because you can say that this woman caused them their power and caused them the rule of Tunisia so my greetings to Abir Musi and tell her that a member of the parliament in the UAE is hailing your bravery and your courage in the parliament and i hope that we have another abir musi or the like of abir musi thank you very much thank you very much uh, your excellency dirar bilhul al falasi i was expecting to hear something related to the effort of the state and i mean here the government institutions that uh, counter the Muslim Brotherhood and counter their influence. Maybe Dr. Amani talked about the national state and how uh, the Egypt state uh, expelled uh, the Muslim Brotherhood ideology. If you allow me, uh, Mr. Hani, in the UAE, we can uh, read the book of Judur uh, At-Ta'amur, which is translated to the conspiracy origins. And uh, we have to say that uh, the word using this uh, reform uh, magazine, Al-Islah. And I'd like to say that uh, in this book, uh, The Conspiracy Roots, Judur Ta'amur, you will conclude that the United Arab Emirates uh, traced their origins to know what they did with the cooperative societies, and, of course, they targeted these cooperative societies because they know there is money in these entities and they were manipulating the elders and they took some signing and signed papers from them in order to use that in the elections. And we know that there was a company that was used to transfer 35,000 dirham to Egypt twice a week when uh, Mohammed Morsi was uh, the president uh, of Egypt. But that was uh, revealed. And uh, most importantly is uh, to drain and uh, dry 
the financing sources of the Muslim Brotherhood. Thank you. I thank you for uh, this uh, addition and I would like to come back uh, to the point uh, of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in the Arab countries because uh, so far not all the countries uh, got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood but they are about to achieve this uh, objective and goal. And as a, a researcher specialized in security matters, I think that uh, in the United uh, in uh, Egypt and even in the United Arab Emirates, uh, there is no denial that uh, they are against the Muslim Brotherhood. But uh, some entities uh, did not mention uh, the uh, support of uh, Egypt and the most uh, and the, the United Arab Emirates uh, to the countries that are fighting the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, of course uh, with the efforts of Egypt and uh, the United Arab Emirates they accelerated the path of getting rid of the Muslim Brotherhood and when an observer looks at the experience of the Muslim Brotherhood and from their perspective if they do not talk about the effort of the government entities in different uh, Arab uh, states, uh, maybe they could conclude that uh, their ideology vanishes and uh, is over, but we would uh, find out uh, soon and eventually that uh, this uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, is remobilizing its members uh, and uh, resurging and of course as we said in the beginning if we look at the different Arab experiences we have to raise several questions and I would like to share some of these questions with you let me start with the first question to Dr. Amani because she talked about the victimhood that is used by the Muslim Brotherhood and my question can the Muslim Brotherhood use its participation in the government and also the victimhood or the economic network and maybe Mr. Dilar also can answer partly this uh, question so can the Muslim Brotherhood really re-emerges from Europe uh, to the Arab countries and uh, we know uh, their presence uh, in uh, Western countries maybe using some lobbies there or use their resources uh, in the main HQ of the Muslim Brotherhood. So do you think Dr. Amani that the Muslim Brotherhood can reproduce its presence and existence in the Arab world again? Two minutes please. Thank you very much Mr. Hani. Uh, Dr. Dirar, I thank you for your presentation because you tackled a very important element uh, and uh, especially uh, the element of the fall uh, of the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood with some reservations. And I would like to say that the victimhood uh, propaganda is uh, well known. Uh, 
in the Muslim Brotherhood. I am in Canada and uh, I am telling you that we are we progressed and we became the first uh, entities to reveal the real truth of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, uh, with the pragmatism uh, and uh, the wisdom that is uh, used by them we can say that uh, the West has not been uh, targeted enough by the Muslim Brotherhood but uh, look at uh, Canada and the North America if you say the same uh, thing in US or in North America you will uh, be uh, accused of being uh, discriminatory well uh, as you know there is a freedom of speech but you are not allowed to accuse the Muslim Brotherhood in Canada it's why the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood is existing as a variant version in the West so do you think that the Muslim Brotherhood can reproduce itself in the Arab world given this victimhood and uh, we know that the embassies of the western countries are not idle they are producing reports and they share with their government what's happening exactly and this is what we try uh, to uh, do and we are uh, suffering in Egypt uh, and we struggle to say these uh, opinions and express this, these opinions without suffering and without difficulties. So, for instance, some uh, Muslim Brotherhood members, they say we are liberals and we support the homosexuals, etc. in order to be empowered. So I return to what um, Mr. Dirar said we have to dry the financing resources of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, through the embassies and also through the scientific research and we should let the academics do their job otherwise there will be some blind spots that cannot be dealt with. Thank you doctor. I would like to hit two birds by one stone because we are running out of times we are running out of time the second question is in the same context uh, can the Muslim Brotherhood use uh, the networks they have in Europe and in the West to re-emerge again and the other part of the question is related to Iran because the sanctions on Iran should be continuous because Iran supports the Hamas movement which is part of the Muslim Brotherhood and now there is a transformation in the international perspective toward Iran in the past it was described as a rogue nation and now they are talking with it and having negotiations with it so two minutes Dr. Dirar regarding Iran I think that uh, it is difficult with Iran because Iran uh, is uh, very patient in the negotiations and if you play with Iran uh, we will know you will not go very far because they are used to sanctions so if you focus on cutting the line that reaches uh, uh, Hamas I think that uh, this is relative uh, I said once that COVID-19 even because of its uh, disadvantages uh, it was uh, it was uh, a grant from God uh, because uh, 
we didn't see the Arab Spring 2.0 reactivated. Now they are busy with the closures, with the lockdowns, so they are kind of busy. And of course, this gives us an opportunity to move. So I think that we have to be proactive and we don't have to wait until they emerge. We have to be proactive in defeating them. And I do believe that we have to defeat them because by doing so, we will get rid of many problems. Thank you. Doctor, allow me uh, to... go to Miss Dr. Farid and Dr. Ali. Just one quick thing. In order uh, to uh, defeat the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, we have uh, to talk to the academies uh, of the West using their language. We have to show uh, to them the discrimination uh, of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. We have to show with them uh, the different linkages that they have and the tactics that they have. Thank you. I will ask two questions to Dr. Farid and Dr. Ali. And I will quickly take your answers because I am willing to know the views of all the speakers but of course as you can see the time is about to expire number one or the conflict in libya in yemen and also in sudan because it is not living in stability currently and the previous members of the al-bashir are still there do you think that this is a chance for the Muslim Brotherhood to reproduce their existence in the Arab world or not? Number two is inspired by Dr. Ali and Dr. Farid completed it. It's why I am asking this second question because it is based on your shared perspectives. Are we supposed to study the national context, uh, the legal, economic, uh, social? Do we have to study this context that allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to extend themselves and uh, to empower themselves and impose themselves on the Arab countries? and then reaching power, as Mr. Dirar said, most of the votes were punishing votes and they were punishing the predecessors in power. Do we have to conduct some comparative studies in order to know how the Muslim Brotherhood reached the power? And I will start with the conflict uh, uh, in the region. Let's start with Dr. Ali. You can comment on both uh, questions and you have two minutes each because uh, our time is about to expire. You have the floor, uh, Dr. Ali. Briefly, uh, Mr. Hani, the two questions for me are subject to demand and offer and it is uh, something necessary we have to take it into consideration for instance the conflict in the arab countries behind this conflict there are speeches and discourses from the west and we cannot think of the ideology of the muslim brotherhood in a segregation of the speeches they promote here or there in Europe, in Canada, in US. And there is an irony of the situation for the Muslim Brotherhood. And we are in a time that is very challenging. 
because the mechanisms that we had in the past 10, 20 years to um, deconstruct the discourse are not relevant currently. Why? Because the Muslim Brotherhood underwent metamorphosis and this led them to uh, think about forging an identity that will enable them to survive for the 10 years. Maybe they will never ever reach uh, power again, but uh, socially speaking, and uh, their presence in the society, it will not vanish easily because it will be based on the demand and offer. So for me, the Muslim Brotherhood will remain waiting their chance to grab power but this time if they reach power it will be for a longer period of time in my opinion i don't distinguish between what's happening in the arab countries and the maghreb countries in general and what's happening in europe and in the west and we have to take this into account when we analyze this context Thank you very much uh, for this uh, short answer. The question, the floor now is to Dr. Farid. Uh, two minutes, please. Thank you very much. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood movement, I would like to say that uh, it is a movement uh, uh, because the rest of uh, branches uh, in the world they are affiliated to it the muslim brotherhood is uh, always uh, waiting and uh, grabbing the chance to emerge again and it always uh, promotes uh, the slogan that uh, it has uh, the solutions to all problems and it uh, present itself to the international community as uh, it is the representative of the mainstream of the Arab countries. And uh, as Dr. Amani said, in the Western academies, many members de adopt uh, this uh, notion, this illusionary, illusionary notion about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the other thing is how the Muslim Brotherhood used the context and we have to admit that Egypt is not Tunisia, is not Syria, is not Morocco. But these groups have one strategy and I would remind you that when Lotfi was a member of the government, when Al Jibali was hidden the government, he was saying in the social media that he asks the support of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And he said at the time that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt will not allow the fall of the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunisia in March 2013. So the same thing applied to other situations. When the Muslim Brotherhood collapsed in Egypt, they tried to reposition themselves and refer to the Muslim Brotherhood of Tunisia from where the Arab Spring sprouted. And we have to say that the Muslim Brotherhood are not the only players. There are the states with their, govern with their government entities and uh, there are the societies and communities, and we have to focus on these communities and societies as they are uh, the most reliable front. We don't have to talk only about the networks of the Muslim Brotherhood, but also we have to talk about the shield of the societies. And in uh, July 2021, everyone in the Arab world uh, so how the 
young protesters head to the headquarters of the uh, Anahda movement in order to pronounce the defeat and the fall of the Muslim Brotherhood model and if we enable the societies to empower themselves this will work more and of course we have to continue drying the resources of financing of the Muslim Brotherhood in addition to the octopus of the associations that are everywhere. Thank you very much doctor. I was very happy discussing this point with you and uh, I hope that all the viewers uh, have enjoyed uh, this uh, perspectives, this diverse uh, opinions uh, and of course uh, we have talked about uh, a cancer that uh, was about uh, to harm uh, our nations. I thank Dr. Amani, I thank uh, Dr. Ali, Dr. Dirar, and Dr. Farid. I thank you all, and my thanks go also to Trends Research and Advisory and to Dr. Muhammad Al Ali, who allowed us to meet uh, in this symposium. I hope that uh, this is not the last time we wish to see you again and we always bid on trends research and advisory to conduct events like this in which we can exchange opinions that are useful to all of us thank you very much and i thank again trends research and advisory and peace be upon you <laughs>